Hey, welcome to Mount Pleasant. So excited you guys are here. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to worship together.
continue to worship and let's celebrate this next song, the freedom that we have in Christ.
love you. We are so thankful for you. We're so thankful for your son. God, we never want to forget the sacrifice that, that you made. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You all can have a seat. There's a man named Victor. He's 22 years old. Here's a picture of him. Uh, he decided one morning he was going to get up, and he lived out in California. He was going to go to Sequoia National Park. He's going to take a beautiful nature walk. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. But as he was taking his walk by the rushing river, there was a family uh, real close to him. They had a little five-year-old boy named Vincent. A little five-year-old boy slipped on a rock and ended up falling into the river, a rushing river, a huge river, five-year-old boy. Victor doesn't hesitate, and he jumps in to try to save the boy. As he jumps in, the boy grabs a hold of Victor's neck. And what most people didn't realize in that moment was that the 22-year-old Victor could not swim. Even though he could not swim, he still jumped in and did not hesitate to try to save the boy's life. There were several others. The parents jumped in. They tried to save their son. And somehow, in like a last-ditch effort, he chucks the kid up on the shoreline, and they were able to grab the kid and save the five-year-old. But Victor didn't make it. Here's a picture of the little five-year-old Vincent. He saved his life. He was a hero that day, but it cost him everything. See, for us in this moment, we know that Jesus is our victor that he saved us from drowning in our sins. And we never want to forget the significance of that. I know five-year-old Vincent, in that moment, at that young of an age, he's not going to understand the full significance of what Victor did for him. And maybe as he grows, he's going to learn more and more. And I know even for us, we can understand the basics of what Jesus did for us here today. And more and more as we meditate on the cross, on Jesus and what he's done to save us, more and more we appreciate what he's done for us. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we're just humbled. The fact that you did not hesitate to send your son. That Jesus just jumped right in to save us. And, and God, there are moments when we just have an elementary understanding of what that means. And, and I pray that you would take us to a different level of depth of meaning of what Jesus has saved us from and what he saved us for. So in this moment, as we meditate on the cross, would you speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, and let us know the depths of what your son has done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to take the bread and the juice at this time.
As we continue to worship through a time of giving of our offerings, I want to say thank you for being a part of the great kingdom work that we get to be a part of, the Jesus mission all over the world. Right now, we have about a dozen members of a team in Poland doing sports camps and ministry outreach with Pro-Am. And we want to say thank you because, because of giving, we're able to have an impact all over the world. And especially this last season, they're serving a lot of Ukrainian refugees that are displaced from the war. So you have had a very active part and making a difference in that area of the world. Uh, we, every week we do a change for a dollar initiative and that's where we ask everybody to give an extra dollar for everybody in your family to help another family in need. And this week we're gonna support the Johnson family. Johnson family got some rough news this past season. Uh, Cameron, who's the dad, a beautiful looking family. Uh, he was diagnosed with ALS. And if you know that debilitating disease is brutal and uh, they don't have a cure for it yet. And it's gotten to the point where he's taken treatments and he's not able to work right now. So uh, we want to go ahead and support this family and give them a gift and let them know they're loved by a church family here in Greenwood. Uh, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll celebrate the opportunity to give. Father God in heaven, it really is an honor to be a part of just your mission to want to reach people all over the world, to want to love people all over the world. We pray that you be with that team in Poland, that you would equip them, give them the right words, give them the energy that they need. God, just work powerfully through them and the pro and ministry to reach so many people. And God, our hearts are heavy for families like the Johnson family. And, and we pray, God, that they would have a strong sense of your presence, especially uh, that there's a church family who loves them, who cares, that they would know that you love them and that you care. So we pray, uh, God, that you continue to use us to further the Jesus mission. We pray in his name, amen. Let's celebrate the opportunity to give. Here's a few updates from MPTV. Hi, I'm Max. Thanks for being here. If you're joining us in person, Make sure to take advantage of these cards and your seat backs to get connected to us. We've got cards for first time guests, prayer requests, and even to get plugged into different areas of our ministry. We'd love to connect to you personally. So please fill out the card and return it to guest connections after service. If you're not ready to connect in person or you're joining us online, there are digital versions of each of these cards. Either scan the QR code found on each card or just click the link your host put in the chat to connect. Are you the kind of person who loves to be outside? Wave at the cars going down the street and greet your neighbors as they get home from work. If you're thinking yes in your head right now, then the parking ministry may be the perfect spot for you to start serving. This brand new serving opportunity will get you outside. And you'll even have a cool vest to make sure people can see you while they're parking. Whether you've ever thought about it or not, the weekend worship experience really begins and ends in the parking lot. It's the place for first and last impressions. The perfect time to share your excitement for worship with guests and members you encounter, and it's truly a ministry of hospitality. If you'd like to find out more about this opportunity and get connected, email Whitney at wsmall at mpccministry.com. It's a brand new month, and that means we're collecting shampoo as our impact center item of the month. You can drop off your donations at the impact center in the commons, at the CLC, or at any of our impact campuses. There's still tons of time to partner with us for our Love Your Neighbor Back to School opportunities. First, head to the Commons or to our Back to School page on our website and grab a tag or two and purchase the items on the card, returning them by July 30th. Then make sure to get registered for Back to School Bash at one of our Impact campuses. Each campus is partnered with the local school and will be celebrating them on Saturday, August 12th. You can find all the details at mpcc.info. Check out this quick message about soul care from Ken and Mary Kay Jones. Soul care, it, uh, the best way to describe soul care to me is just that we all have a heart and a soul. We need a lot of care because we get bumped around, and we get wounded, we get hurt. Suffering is a part of that journey. Yeah. It's a way that we share in Christ's own suffering. It helps me to worship God better. It deepens my reservoir of resources that I have in Him. I have just a much greater appreciation for how truly involved in the details of my life He is. Many times I'm helping someone, whether it's in a counseling conversation or group, it's not unusual 
for me to be thinking I had this exact issue this morning. And so then it becomes a question of, am I qualified to help someone who is also in the same boat as me? I'm in the same boat as they are. In fact, that qualifies me at different times to like, and be able to maybe share that and say, you know, I get that because it's not that been that long ago that I've been in the same predicament as you. We have a, a team that we've spent time training. They've also personally benefited from being in the groups, not just as leaders, but as participants as well. And we are wanting to add more members to our team this year. If it's something that you're interested in, give me a, a send me an email. If you're interested in, in joining the Soul Care team, I'm Mary Kay Jones, the one you always hear, contact Mary Kay Jones, register with Mary Kay Jones. She's, I'm Mary Kay Jones. <laughs> and, and, and she is the organizational force of Soul Care. And I'm the fly by the seat of your pants part of Soul Care. If you are interested in joining the Soul Care team, or if you want to learn more about Soul Care's fall groups, head to the Commons to pick up the fall catalog for Soul Care. Make sure to stay connected with us on social media to learn more about everything going on at Mount Pleasant. And don't forget to upload pictures of the students and educators in your life for our back to school service at the end of the month. Now, let's focus on our message from our high school pastor, Matt Pineda, as he continues in our series called Unashamed. Yesterday, I got a text from Pastor Chris just asking me to start our time together with a message that he's written for you to hear. And so here's what he has to say. He says, as many as you probably already know, Reggie Epps, who was the senior pastor at Mount Pleasant from 19, 1992 to the early part of 2001, passed away this week on Thursday after battling two different kinds of blood cancer. I've known Reggie for over 40 years, and I could tell you he was a great man of God, a powerful Bible teacher and a visionary leader. It was under his leadership that Mount Pleasant grew to be a mega church and his leadership produced that same result at Legacy Christian Church in Kansas City. Reggie leaves a strong spiritual legacy for his family and for the thousands upon thousands of people he impacted during his ministry. Mount Pleasant will forever be grateful for him for creating the opportunity to be a church that literally changes the world for Christ, one life, one family, one opportunity at a time. And so he asks, will we please keep his wife Shara and the entire Epps family in your prayers. And so he also asked me to lead us in a time of prayer just for the Epps family and uh, for Legacy Christian Church, our sister church, as they just walk through this process together. So here's what I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask that where you are, just would you put your hands out like this? It's just a way to ask God uh, to bless this uh, prayer that we're gonna ask him. Lord, we're so thankful. And uh, in a moment for many people in this room who have been at this church for a very long time, with a heavy heart of hearing of the passing of Reggie. And just one, thankful for the life and the ministry that Reggie has had, not only in this community, but also everywhere that he has been, helping to, to lead people closer to Jesus by preaching the gospel and, and leading people within the church. We're thankful for his life, his impact, and what he has done, and especially the difference that he has made here at this church and here in our community but we lift up his wife, his family, his church family who are hurting and walking through a very difficult time if they've, if they've lost a husband and a brother and their pastor. And so we just pray your blessing over them that you would give them peace and comfort and some type of understanding of what is next for them. And that is our prayer as we lift up to you, Lord, Reggie, and his family. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue our time as we walk through the book of Romans with this series called Unashamed. And I want to take you back in time as we start this because I was seven years old when the video game NBA Jam released into arcades. Anybody remember this game? If you don't, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I think I had this game on my original Nintendo, the one that had like two buttons on it, right? And uh, it's a two-on-two -two basketball game, and uh, it, this was the game. When I was growing up, this was the game that I loved to play. I would play with my friends and beat my sister and all that kind of stuff, right? But 
a lot of people know if you've played this game, there was a little feature that was a part of this two-on-two basketball game that was called On Fire, right? Where you would catch fire. And it was literally the coolest thing because if you made three shots in a row, you caught fire and the ball literally caught on fire, right? And it, it, was, it was cool. So every time you touched it, no matter where you shot it, it went in, right? It was, it was the coolest thing. It made you very, very difficult to beat. In fact, if you ever heard the term boom shakalaka, that's from M- NBA Jam, okay? But few people know, as a part of NBA Jam, um, that there was a cheat code, okay? I don't know how I knew this, um, but some, some point along the way, I figured out that if you just press B seven times really fast and hold B in the up button right before tip off, you would catch fire from the very beginning. And it just made you impossible to be. I was playing at an advantage that nobody else had and it made you virtually impossible to beat. Here's why I tell you that, as silly and ridiculous as that is. I think that Romans chapter eight is a little bit of a cheat code. It's the feature that allows you to win, to have the abilities to separate you from everybody else. And what's the best part about it is that it's available to anyone. Anyone can have access to what we're gonna read. Romans chapter eight is actually renowned as one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. And it just so happened to fall into my lap as we progress through this series through Romans chapter by chapter, seeing what we can learn from God. And so I want you to engage with this today, no matter where you find yourself, because I know that some of you are in this room because someone made you be here, whether it was your spouse or your parent or uh, for any other reason, you may have found yourself in this place because I'm, I just, I'm, I'm, I was told to come. And I think if you were to lean in and engage just a little bit with the words that we're gonna read today, it may change the way that you view God and your desire to have a relationship with him. Some of you, have been around here for a long time, and if you would just lean in just a little bit to decipher what God is telling you through these words and the challenges that come out of them, you may walk out of here different. So I just want to encourage you from the beginning just to lean in and to pay attention. In a moment, we're going to read Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. So if you have a Bible, your Bible apps, get there, um, because we're going to read all those verses. Last week, we finished Romans chapter 7, and Chris Franklin gave us a, a great synopsis of what Paul was trying to teach as he talks about, you remember, he talks about this interior battle, right? This, this battle that's going on inside all of us where um, I, I do the things that I don't want to do and the things that I know that I'm supposed to do, I don't do those. And so he talks about this battle internally that's going on inside of him that he just can't do the right thing. And so it, it was an amazing ending to Romans chapter 7 because I, I think that we've all been there before, the idea of knowing what we're supposed to do and we don't do it and all that kind of stuff. Romans chapter seven ends like this. Paul says this, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's through that thought that we come to Romans chapter eight, which matters because all of us need this deliverance that comes from Jesus. Every single one of us need this. So I'm gonna ask you to stand with me. We're gonna read Romans chapter eight, verses one through 13 as a way to honor God's word this morning. Paul says this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned the sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind is governed by the flesh, that is governed by the flesh is death, but the mind that is governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, They do not belong to Christ, but if Christ is in you, 
then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Thank you guys, you could be seated. I'd like to honor God's word as a part of our service by standing and reading it. These words are so important for us as Christians to understand. In Romans chapter eight, the word spirit, which in the Greek is this word pneuma, it appears 21 times. And all but two of those times refer to the Holy Spirit, okay? And so what this means is that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is an active participant in this conversation about flesh and spirit. This is the conversation that we're gonna have. Flesh and spirit will be our focus. I'm gonna walk through this text, all of these words, and I'm gonna offer you four thoughts today on what the Spirit offers you, us as believers, as, as believers in this battle of flesh versus spirit. So here's the first one. We are given a new freedom. And if there was ever a verse that just speaks plainly this truth uh, of, of what this means is chapter eight, verse one. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's a popular verse for Christians, and I understand why. This word condemnation that's right here in the middle is a Greek word that's called katakrima, and it basically means penalty, right? So if you were to reread this, and I know that's not a word that we use a lot, there is now no penalty for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus, it's an amazing truth, especially in light of everything that we have read through the last couple chapters of Romans, specifically Romans chapter five, six, and seven. We've recognized that we are all sinners. We all fall short. None of us can earn righteousness. None of us can earn justification by what we do. And so our sin, it separates us from God. But now Paul says, There's no penalty. There's no penalty for our sin because we are in Jesus. And here's why this is important. When you can remember this truth, when you can remember the redemption to those that's available to those who follow Jesus, you can have this new type of freedom in your life. Let me explain that to you. The next time in your life that you feel like Satan or the the evil one is whispering to you these, these thoughts, bringing up your past, your mistakes, your sin, all of that, you remind him of these words. There is no penalty for my sin. Not for me, at least, because I am in Christ Jesus. I can struggle with this from time to time, often believing that my, my mistakes, my failure, my sin, my past, whatever it is, however you wanna describe it, makes me unworthy to God. It, it, it makes me feel like I'm, I'm falling short in some way that God expects me to reach, you ever feel that way? You ever have those conversations, those, those thoughts in your mind that think that he, he can't use me, he, he, I, I'm too broken, whatever it is, those type of thoughts keep us from experiencing the life that Jesus died for you to have. Here's why I think that's true. I don't believe that Jesus died for you to feel down and bad about your sin. There's a level of that's, that's important. He died so that you would be free from sin. You understand the difference that you would be free from sin, I think so many Christians miss this. We miss this. We, we don't understand that being shackled and ashamed and burdened by your mistakes or your past is so very much anti-gospel. It's the exact opposite of a new and abundant life that Jesus came to bring us. And so I wanna encourage you today to experience the freedom that comes from Jesus that's available for all of us. And so when you are in the midst of a struggle, whether that's right now or or you get bogged down by your past mistakes, I want you to know that there is a new freedom for you here. It's found in what Jesus has done for you, not what you can do for yourself. It's by what he has done for you through his life, death, and resurrection. Here's what it does. This is what I I have found in my life. When you can work in this mode of freedom, it removes guilt, it removes shame, and it removes embarrassment about your sin, and it replaces those things with love and appreciation 
and excitement for what Jesus can and will do through you. You remember how the hymn goes, right? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now, if I was a good singer, I would have sang that for you, but that's not my forte. You see it, right? Jesus paid it all. Not some of it, not most of it, all of it. Jesus paid the price and the penalty for your sin through his death and his resurrection. And because of that, you can experience cleansing from sin and thus freedom in your life. And it's freedom from expectation to perform, freedom that you don't have to be perfect, freedom to, because you can't accomplish this on your own, right? You cannot accomplish it on the first place. Look what he says again. He says, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, that's us, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be what? a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, the freedom. This freedom comes from Jesus because he is the sin offering and it makes a difference in our lives. I want you to think about Paul for a second, right? Paul was the guy who wrote these words first, but second, he was the one that was standing over the dead and bruised body of Stephen, the first martyr, as he approved of his death. And Paul went on to hunt Christians and put them into prison. And he was responsible for a lot of persecution from the early church. If you know Paul's story, right? He got, his life got changed around because he met Jesus. Here's why I think this is important. You don't see in any of Paul's preaching or his writing, him trying to pay it back. Trying, trying to think that he owes something to Jesus for covering his debt. No, all of Paul's preaching, all of his writing is about this. It's about experiencing the grace and sharing the grace that he received on that road to Damascus. And it wasn't anything that Paul had done at that point because he was blinded at one moment and Jesus said, I got something new for you. Paul didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. And so the rest of his life is preaching about the grace that he received but did not earn. That's what is available to us. And so the question that I want to ask you and challenge you with in this moment is what are you holding on to? What is it in your life that that is preventing you from experiencing an amazing relationship with Christ? What is it that you think that he cannot forgive, that he cannot fix, that he cannot redeem in your life? And once you realize that there is no penalty for your sin, When you are in Christ Jesus, which again, let's back up a second. Romans chapter six reminds us that that is not a license to sin, right? Paul says, should we go on sinning? No, that's not what this means. This is not a license to sin. But when you can experience and understand that there is no penalty for your sin, you experience the peace and the freedom of following Jesus without performance. And I think that's important. And so the law of the spirit brings life and freedom from sin, but it also brings this. Number two is it it brings a new mindset. Paul shows us the dichotomy between two people. One is a Christian, one is not. One follows Jesus, one does not. He says this in verse five. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds on what the spirit desires, the mind is governed, that is governed by the flesh is death, but the mind that is governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You see, one has their mind ruled by the flesh, the other has their mind ruled by the spirit. One brings death, one brings life, one, brings, one is against God, one submits to God. Which side do you wanna be on? The answer is obvious and it's easy. We want to have the mind that is governed by the Spirit. So to live by the Spirit, we must begin to mind the things of the Spirit. So what does that mean? What does that even mean? How do I even do that? Talk. Paul talks about the same type of thing in this letter that he writes to the church in Colossae when he says this. 
He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things free. You died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. This new mindset from the spirit is a, it's available for those of us who follow Jesus, a mindset, get this, it's, it's set on the things above. I, that's what we read, this is what we see. Not on earthly things, here's the problem. I don't know if you know this or not, but we live on earth, right? We're surrounded by earthly things. That's all we see, that's all that's in front of us, that's all that's around us. And so when we talk about <clears throat> living a, a not, not thinking of the things of the world, but think of the things above, it's hard. It's difficult. Our minds tend to be geared towards the things that are earthly because that's what is all in front of us and around us. We are so consumed by the here and the now, yet what is here is fading and what is above is finished. What is here is fading and what is above, the earthly, the spiritual, the heavenly, is finished. The Holy Spirit provides us an avenue to mind the things above. And so we as believers have to be diligent to move our mind towards the things above and off the things of the world. It doesn't happen overnight. It is, it is a journey to become the per, this type of person. The, the person who understands that the way that you live down here is based on your understanding that you're on your way up there. Did you hear what I said? The way that you live down here is based on your understanding that you're on your way up there. It is a new mindset. And I found this really simple yet insightful blog article about this as I was preparing this message from Scott Hubbard at desiringgod.com. And here's one of the things he said, so simple. He says, our minds are full of heaven when they are most full of Christ. Our minds are most full of heaven when they are most full of Christ. He went on to describe ways to continually to move your mind back towards God throughout your day, right? And that, that was his subject, how to, how to be, uh, have this mind that's more heavenly, to move your mind back towards God all throughout your day. And he gave this idea, which is so simple, it's not like, it's not a, a genius idea, but he says, starting your day with prayer or meditation. Simple, not profound, but I just wonder, how many of us are actually doing this? It's so simple. It can happen on your commute to work in the car, right? It doesn't have to look like any one thing. But what could change in your life? What could change in your mind, in your mindset, if you just set aside five minutes somewhere at the beginning of your day to connect with God? And here's why I mentioned this. My fear, my fear is that so many of us are missing the most foundational parts of following Jesus. And spending time with him. You cannot experience the true freedom and a new mind that comes from him if you don't spend time routinely with God. And so maybe that's a great first step for you. If you've walked in here, man, I've, I, I don't know how to get these things. Well, you start there by spending time with, with God. But here's my question for all of us. <laughs> what area of your life needs a break from the world to focus on God? You think about that for a second. What area of your life needs a break from the world to focus on God, specifically mentally? The things that you think about. And there's all kinds of answers. It could be sports or politics or television, whatever the answer is. And none of these things are bad in and of themselves, right? Well, politics kind of stink in my opinion, but you know, you get what I mean. We, what in your life, what do you just need to focus on mentally just a little bit less that you could lay down the earthly to focus on things that are more heavenly? Spend a little bit more time with God and a little bit less time in the world. It's not a hard concept, right? Spend a little bit more time with God and a little bit less time with your mind focused on things below. Remember, Paul was talking about this battle as we talk about the mind, the battle between the flesh in the spirit and how your mind fits into that. But let's go back to Romans chapter eight again. It says this, those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds on what the spirit desires. My daughter, she just finished up a season of softball and um, it was a new atmosphere for us. It was her first season doing this. 
highly competitive, okay? But a lot of fun, highly competitive. Anyways, with first graders in softball, there's a lot of things that go on. And one of the things that happens, which are bound to happen, are mistakes. In softball or baseball, you call them errors, right? And so inevitably, because they're first graders, uh, they're going to miss the ball when it's hit to them, or they're going to throw it past first base and miss the first baseman, you know, whatever. And um, it's difficult, or at least this this is my first experience doing this, okay, but it's difficult for these little kids because as you're in the field and there's nine or ten of you out there and you make the bad play, you feel like you let your whole team down, right? I mean, everybody's like, Really, right? And then your dad's over there yelling at you, right? And so you got all these things going on. And what I noticed very on in, early on in the season is that it was easy just to get like your head down. Just like, oh, man, I blew it, right? And so what we, at least what I realized early on is like, I had to be more mature than the first graders, but I had to like, I had to like recognize I need to help them, right? To, to move their mind off of what just happened and what was next. And so I would tell them, all right, that's all right. All right, shake it off. The play's at first, right? And we, <laughs> this is a routine all throughout the season. Shake it off. The play's at first. All right, get your head up. Get your glove down. Watch for the ball, right? And so because it was so easy for them to just get bogged down, I messed up. We made a mistake. Another runner got on that they wouldn't be ready for the next play. And so we continually had to move their mind off of what just happened into what was going to happen next. And here's why I tell you that the same is true in having a new mindset with the spirit. It is not about the here and the now and the earthly and what's happening in this place. It's about what's next, what's above, what matters more, what's more important, what's most important. And when you live in accordance with the spirit, your mind will be set on spiritual things, things above. And so this is what we have to move towards and this is where we find ourselves. But there's more to this text, there's more to this story. Paul tells us, I, I think the next thing that we have is a new presence, a new presence. You remember the cheat code I told you about, right? There's all kinds of cheat codes in video games. I don't know, I don't know if you know this or not. You can unlock certain features, different types of things and some of the things give you an advantage over other people. Here's what I think. The ultimate cheat code in life is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you recognize this, things change in your life. Think about it. I don't think we talk about this enough. The living presence of God is available to live inside of you. The living presence of God is available to live inside of you when you choose to follow Christ, when you're obedient in baptism, and when you accept his gift of salvation. With the power of the Holy Spirit, you are at an advantage over everyone else. You have God's presence inside of you. Look at these words again that Paul says, starting in verse 9. He says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. Listen to these words. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit of, gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. And so here's the truth that we hang on to. God's spirit conquers our flesh. When we are weak, he is strong. And when we allow ourselves to be ruled by the spirit and not the flesh, we experience life from a different perspective than everyone else. God's presence inside of you. It's something that I promise you every single person in the Old Testament wishes that they had. They had to wait on a pillar of fire or a voice coming from the clouds. We have his presence living inside of us. And so many people in this world neglect what is available to them. I wouldn't want a single person to walk out of this room not knowing the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life, it is a cheat code. It is an advantage that we as believers get to feel and to experience God's presence in a way that other people do not or cannot because we have given our lives to him in faith. When you look at the book of Acts, with the exception of one miraculous event for the Gentiles, the presence of the Holy Spirit was given to people at baptism. Every conversion 
In the book of Acts, every conversion results in baptism and every baptism resulted in the giving of the Holy Spirit. Today, you can experience this new presence of the Holy Spirit in your life if you have not already. There's nothing more that someone would like to talk to you about after the service than to do that. This is why it's important. In John chapter 16, Jesus, this is bizarre to think about. John 16, Jesus with his disciples. His life's about to end. And Jesus tells them this. He says, it is better for you that I die and leave because the Spirit will come. Jesus told his followers, it's better that he dies and leaves the earth, Jesus Christ. It is better that he leaves because then the Spirit will come. This is what we recognize. It is a new presence that's available to you and we would love for you to experience that. But we have to end our message with a different angle. Uh, we've seen that the Spirit gives a new freedom. It gives us a new mind, a new mindset. And there's a new presence that lives inside of us. But here's what the Spirit also gives. It's a new obligation. Paul wraps up this thought on the Spirit versus the flesh. These, this conversation with these words starting in verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation... But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We have an obligation. The obvious conclusion, I think, from verses 8 through 11 are this. We owe the flesh nothing because we belong to the Spirit, and to Christ. And so our obligation is to the Spirit. That word obligation that we read in there in the Greek is this word of aletes, and it means a debtor, someone who is under obligation to pay back a debt. I didn't really think about it that way when I read this word, but that means we are in debt and we owe our lives to the Spirit. You remember what Christ has done for you uh, through his life and his death, and you are now under obligation to live holy. That's what this idea means. But here's where we need to focus our attention next, because verse 13 takes a totally different turn than everything else that we've read in verses 1 through 12. Now, Paul turns the ship, he starts going in a different direction. Because at this point, he is focused uh, so much on, uh, yes, Jesus has accomplished this for us. He's given us freedom. We have a new mind. The spirit is available to us. But now we need to play the game too. And so he says this. He says, to put to death the misdeeds of the body, right? Or to put to death the flesh. The King James Version, if you were to read that, it says, it calls Christians to mortify the flesh, to kill sin in your life, to eliminate it, to destroy it. Why would we care to do this? Look what else Paul says as he describes this in Galatians chapter five. He says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. The flesh in the spirit, they're enemies. They don't get along, they don't live together. And yet so, so many of us live in this world where we try to fit them together. We try to flee, please the flesh and we try to please the spirit and that's not how it works. The call is to choose a side. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter six. If you hear a couple weeks ago, he says this, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. We have to remove it. We have to kill it. We have to eliminate it. And friends, this is not just some idea that Paul came up with to help people to live a better life. This is what Jesus taught as well. If you go back a little bit further into the Sermon on the Mount, this is how Jesus described it. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, please listen to me carefully. Jesus is using hyperbole. Hyperbole. It's an exaggerated statement to get across his thought and his point. 
He is not calling anyone, any of you, to any level of self-harm. That is not what he is doing in this moment, in this context. But what he is calling you to is to take sin seriously and to do whatever you need to do to get rid of it. Over and over, we are seeing the same truth. Paul said to put to death the flesh because we as Christians are living by the Spirit. And if I were to challenge you with one thing from this first part of Romans chapter eight, which I just chose the first 13 verses, the rest of Romans chapter eight is amazing. You should read it as well. But from Romans chapter eight, the first part would be to recognize this, that you are in Christ. You are in Christ. His Spirit is dwelling inside of you and it gives you a special advantage, but please stop living as if the spirit of the living God is not enough for you in this life. We gotta get that out of our mind. It's his presence living inside of you. It's the cheat code, it's the boom shakalaka for your life. You experience freedom, the new mind, his presence, but you've gotta draw a line in the sand with sin at some point. You have to draw a line and to make some choices to choose his spirit over the flesh. And I know it's hard. I know it is, but this is what it looks like to live in the spirit and to follow Jesus. So I wanna challenge you for a moment with another thought, another question. What in your life, what needs to die in your life? Could you just think about that for a second? What, what needs to die in your life? What have you been controlled by in your flesh? that needs cut off? What sin have you been playing games with for too long that you need to do something about it? Sin does not die on its own. You have to end it. I was reminded recently of an ancient um, North or a Native American legend um, about the two wolves living inside of you. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I'm sure many of you have, but I actually think it's a biblical principle, but um, most people attribute it to the Cherokee. And so the legend goes like this. There's, a, there's an elder in the community that's describing uh, to this young person the battle that's happening inside of him. And he describes it by two wolves who are fighting. And so uh, he, he describes one that is evil. And it represents all the things that are evil. Anger and jealousy and hatred and everything that you can think of that is, that is evil. That's what that wolf represents. And then there's one that is good. And all the things that are good, you know, love and peace and joy and kindness and everything that you can associate with good. And so he talks about this battle that's happening inside of him, of, of a lot like Romans chapter seven, there, there's, there's good and there's bad and I don't, there's this fight going on and what's gonna come out. And so at some point uh, about this battle of these wolves, the young person who's listening says, you know, which one's gonna win? And the elder's answer is so simple. He says this, whichever one you feed. Church, there is a war going on inside of you. It is the battle of satisfying the flesh or the spirit and the one that you feed is gonna win. And so the question is, what do you need to do in order to feed the right one? Many people think that you have to give up pleasure to pursue holiness, but you actually find, I think you find pleasure in the pursuit you find life, you find joy. Sin never satisfies. Sin never gives life, it always takes it away. Sin destroys you, but living in the spirit and what God has for you is what you actually need. We have an obligation, it is not to the flesh, but it is to the spirit and to pursue it. And so again, I wanna ask you that question, what needs to die in your life? In a few moments, I'm gonna invite you to respond to this because here's the deal, every single one of us have a response to this. This is not a message that's like, well, I, I've got this down, I'm doing okay. This is for other people to get their life. No, this is all of us. All of us are in the battle of flesh and sin and all of us have something that needs to be turned over to the Lord. So maybe you could choose to respond to that in some way. Here's how I'll close today. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. He's given you his Holy Spirit to live inside of you for purpose and meaning and the moment that you begin to drown out the Spirit's voice and guidance and direction in your life, it creates a war, a war of flesh and spirit. The battle's gonna be won. The flesh will never be victorious. The question is, at the end of your life, 
Which side will you be grasping to? The spirit or the flesh? Apostle John says this, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And so, if this is true, if the flesh is temporary and the spirit is eternal, then the truth that we land on is that we live according to the spirit to find true life. That's for the here and now. That's for your future as well. I'm hoping that as you've looked through Romans chapter eight, you've seen what Jesus has done for you, the, the, the spirit that he gives to us, the responsibility that we have to feed the spirit in our life and not the flesh. And when we do this, we draw closer to God, closer to our creator and experience his presence in our life more fully and find contentment. I'm hoping that today you will feel compelled to walk in the spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us. We come into this place every week to worship you and sing these words and to open your scripture. And today I'm reminded of what you have accomplished for us through your life and your death and your resurrection. You give us hope, you give us freedom. You can change our life right here and right now when we choose to follow you. And so Lord, I'm praying that in this moment, as we walk out of this place, that we we're changed on some level. We recognize the call that you have for us to, to, to feed the spiritual and not the physical. And that you would help us to be honest and mature enough as Christians to respond to your word and to take action. Thank you for Jesus and what he's done for us. In his name I pray, amen. Hey, I invite you to stand and just have a moment to respond. There'll be some prayer counselors up here. It's also steps up here if you just want a moment to recognize what the Lord is calling you to this morning. Help us to be a church and to pastor with you as we sing and respond. Stand beside
can have a seat we're going to celebrate this morning as we uh, watch some baptisms. Hey everyone, this is Brent and he has come today to give his life to Jesus and follow his instruction in baptism. And so Brent's here also with his best friend, Josh, who's gonna be baptized in a moment as well. And so I just want you to repeat the confession. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. And I confess him. And I confess him. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Brent, because of your confession, I wanna baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Josh, Brent's best friend. Brent, or Josh, I'm going to ask you to repeat the same confession. Yep. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I confess Him. And I confess Him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Because of your confession, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, I hope you guys have a great week. This concludes our service. If you're new around here, I uh, hope you guys had a great time. Uh, we'd love to connect with you out in Guest Connections, which is out the devil doors and to the right. And then uh, we have our back to school drive. Grab a tag out in the commons or lobby area. We'll see you next week, all right?